Okay, so uh, we can uh, continue with the amazing Anapana Sati Sutta, the Sutta on Mindfulness of Breathing. Yeah. And uh, it is quite amazing what comes out of the humble process of breathing. Yeah. Who would have thought all of this can actually happen just by watching your breath? Uh, it's like magic happening. Almost, uh, and uh, this is what makes this so uh, extraordinarily interesting. Yeah that all of this is available just by such a simple thing yeah, as observing the breath in a particular way, yeah, just by letting go yeah, and kind of allowing this process to happen. Yeah. So, so far we have looked at uh, the uh, equivalent of the contemplation of the body yeah, and then the contemplation of feeling, yeah, uh, known as Kaya Nupassana and Vedana Nupassana yeah, in the Pali language. Yeah. Next one, we come into what is known as citta nupassana, which means contemplation of the mind. And uh, so again, I will just uh, start by uh, reading out to you what we have here, and then we will discuss it in a bit of detail. So it says they practice uh, like this. I'll breathe in experiencing the mind. They practice like this. I will breathe out experiencing the mind. They practice like this. I'll breathe in gladdening the mind. They practice like this. I'll breathe out gladdening the mind. They practice like this. I'll breathe in immersing the mind or stilling the mind, if you like. I'll practice like this. I'll breathe out stilling the mind. They practice like this, I'll breathe in freeing the mind. They practice like this, I will breathe out freeing the mind. So this is the uh, uh, citta nupassana, the contemplation of mind. And it begins with the idea of experiencing the mind. So this is citta patisang vedi. Uh, and what exactly does it mean to experience the mind? Uh, yeah, it may not be obvious, or maybe it is too obvious, or I'm not sure. What is the mind anyway? Well, it's whatever kind of goes on inside of us. Uh, whatever is not physical belongs to the body. Whatever is not of the five senses, uh, in a certain way, uh, that is the mind. So. Um, the way to decide what something is, is really to take away all the things that it is not. Uh, and then what you are left with is the mind, right? So if you uh, kind of allow the body to disappear and you allow the five senses uh, to go, uh, that which you are left with then is the mind. Uh, so what is that? Uh, and uh, what that is very often in the process of meditation, after you kind of experience the various kinds of bliss in the previous one, uh, we went through the various kinds of bliss and then the calming down of the mind, the other mental activities or the mental process, citta sankara pasambayang or pasambati, calming down. Then when that, once that thing calms down enough, the body really starts to fade into the background. The senses become very weak. And uh, as that bliss becomes strong, uh, it often transforms into this thing you will call, is often known as the Samadhi Nimitta in the present day. Uh, yeah? And the Samadhi Nimitta that we talk about, this is basically a contemporary use of this word, it's not actually how it is used in the suttas. Uh, but anyway, that is how it is used. Uh, it is often seen like a disk of light in the mind, yeah? like the moon or the sun uh, or something like that. Uh, People experience it in different ways. Sometimes they can see stars or, or whatever. But uh, the ideal nimitta is like the sun appearing in the mind. Yeah? And uh, when the sun appears in the mind, and this is very, you're drawn to these things because they're so powerful. Uh, you're really drawn in. Uh, because of that, the body and the five senses really start to disappear because the mental object is so powerful. That draws you in uh, and everything else pretty much becomes irrelevant. Uh, so at this particular point, this seems to be the most uh, obvious explanation of what is happening. Uh, yeah? You're kind of drawn to this mental image, uh, this samadhi nimitta. Now this uh, word samadhi nimitta or samadhi nimitta uh, is actually used in one way in the suttas and another way in uh, contemporary Buddhism. In contemporary Buddhism it is used in the way that I talk about it. In the suttas, uh, samadhi nimitta basically means an object or a subject of meditation. Uh, 
that which leads you to samadhi, right? So, for example, in the suttas, the idea of samadhi nimitta would be something like, uh, actually this explained as the um, cemetery contemplations. Uh, yeah, it's kind of strange, isn't it? But cemetery contemplation are actually a samadhi nimitta. So you contemplate uh, a corpse, and when that is successful, you attain samadhi. And it, for that reason, it's called the samadhi nimitta. Uh, or the four... Uh, applications of mindfulness, the four satipatthanas, are called samadhi nimittas in the suttas. Uh, in other words, the breathing process itself, the whole process of breathing, is a samadhi nimitta because it is the uh, the object or the subject that you use uh, to achieve samadhi in this way. Uh. But so we can see here how things have changed a little bit over the over the uh, millennia or centuries or whatever. Uh, and, the, and this is kind of important to recognize that contemporary Buddhism does not always speak in the same way as the suttas. Uh, so you have to be careful to, uh, when you read the suttas, you have to be careful to interpret them using their own ideas, their own language, uh, and not kind of reading contemporary ideas into the suttas, because then you are often distorting the message uh, of the suttas. Uh. So that is an important difference. And the way... Uh, this uh, nim- nimittas or samadhi nimittas are used uh, in the present day. They're often used for any kind of image in the mind. Uh, if you travel to, say, Thailand, uh, yeah, and you speak to some of these uh, meditation teachers, uh, and they will say that you have a nimitta, it means you have an image in the mind. Uh, and it can mean anything. Yeah, It can mean all kinds of uh, kind of uh, images of landscapes or people or different realms or whatever. Uh, and they would use that name to explain these things. Uh, but that is not really the kind of thing that we are looking for here. Uh, what we're looking for here is something very simple uh, and very powerful and very bright. Uh, yeah, something which has the ability to draw you in. Uh, and something which gives rise to samadhi must be simple because if it's too diverse, uh, it has too many colors, too many features, too much activity, too much stuff going on. Uh, uh, it is not really it doesn't have that power to unify the mind and bring it to one pointedness, uh, which is what samadhi really is about. Uh, so we're looking for simple nimittas, not kind of uh, broad ones. Uh, and this is a good indication of what we are supposed to do in this particular uh, stage of the meditation. Yes, yeah? simplify things, uh, keep things unified, uh, not diverse them, uh, don't diversify them. Uh, uh, look at the core of the object, the center of the object, not on the edges, uh, so that you keep things very, very as simple as possible, a uh, few details and features as you possibly can. That is really the kind of the idea here. Uh, yeah, so this uh, nimitta should be simple. Uh, it is very common for people to have experiences in the meditation and to see things in the meditation. Uh, People often come, oh, I see these kind of landscapes and all these kind of things in meditation. What does it mean? I don't know what it means. <laughs> you see landscape, well, we're all conditioned in a certain way. And that conditioning, in a sense, will then um, and it make the mind create particular things that depend on our specific conditioning. So it doesn't really have any particular meaning. The, the point of the mind, rather, is that the mind is very powerful, creative force. Yeah, the mind pretty much creates everything. Yeah. And so when you start to become peaceful, you start to see things. The mind starts to become creative. Yeah. So you can say that if you do see images in your meditation, yeah, it's usually a good sign because it means that the mind is empowered. Yeah, There's more ability to create these things and that takes energy. Yeah. So in a sense, it is a good thing here. Yeah. But in another sense, it is not the kind of image you want because it's too diverse. So images uh, can be a good sign. uh, And if you want to play around with them a little bit and see what happens, that's fine. uh, But uh, eventually you have to let it go. uh, And by letting it go really means uh, coming back to the breath, uh, not paying attention to those images. uh, If they are there, that's okay, but make the breath the main object uh, and gradually the image will fade away by itself. uh, And then you can unify the mind more. uh, And then eventually, when the bliss becomes very powerful, these samadhi nimittas, these uh, disks of light, may arise in the mind. That's when it gets really, really exciting and interesting. So again, we are seeing like a transition here. There's a transition from... uh, 
the Vedana Vipassana, the feelings uh, to the mind objects. Uh, yeah, and one of the always when there is a transition, uh, there can be hiccups. Uh, and so the question is how to make that transition in a kind of smooth way without uh, uh, losing your meditation and these kind of things. Uh, so very often it is like almost automatic as the feelings become very powerful and very blissful uh, and very peaceful. Uh, yeah, these two factors of meditation, the end, bliss and peace coming together, uh, often they, fla- they will see flashes of light. Uh, and at a certain point, those flashes of light start to stabilize uh, into a disk, uh, looking like the sun or something like that. Uh, yeah, and when that disk becomes stable, uh, that is when you kind of, it's almost like your attention goes there naturally, uh, and you just enjoy that uh, staying with that disk. Uh, if it is not stable, uh, if you feel there's too much movement going on, uh, or you feel whatever, uh, yeah, then you just wait. You don't go to that disk straight away unless you feel kind of confident and at ease uh, with focus and all that. Uh, and then you stay with it. O- otherwise, you go back. You just stay with the breath. Yeah? The disk is there. It's not that it doesn't matter. You stay with the breath as your main object uh, until you feel the stability of the image in your mind. Uh, this is how you ensure that the meditation progresses rightly yeah, and smoothly uh, by allowing these things to be stable before you shift your attention to them. Uh. If one of the problems here, yeah, because every time we go deeper in meditation, you are abandoning something, you're letting go of something, uh, that is what enables the death, uh, depth, not the death, death, depth of meditation. Uh. Not going to die yet. Uh, actually, maybe you are dying a little bit. Uh. Mm. I think actually it's true, right? You're always kind of dying a little bit. Every time you go into this, uh, you kind of let it go of something. That's like dying a little bit, isn't it? Uh, and you realize dying is pretty good. Huh? Yeah, it's pretty cool to die. If this is what dying is about, all about, maybe you, okay, don't, you, you don't want to hasten the dying process, but then you, at least you are not so afraid of dying anymore, if this is what dying is all about. Uh, and so, because there is a transition there, sometimes we need to let go of something. Uh, and what we need to let go of in this particular context uh, is the body and the five senses. Uh, right? That is really what is disappearing here. The physical world, the ordinary world we are used to, Fading into the background, uh, the mental world is coming to the foreground. Uh, so to enable that transition, it can be useful to understand the danger in that world of the five senses, right? Uh, and this is really the critical thing at this particular point, is that ability to let go of that world, uh, because you understand it is problematic. Uh, and so if you have contemplated that before, the danger in the world of the five senses, uh, it's pretty dangerous, right? You, it's in the world of the five senses. That's where you have the war in Ukraine. It only happens in the world of the five senses. Uh, go into the mental world. There's no war in Ukraine in the mental world. Uh, no war at all, in fact, uh, in the mental world. Uh, there is no climate change in the mental world. Uh, that's also in the world of the five senses. Uh, there's no arguments in the mental world. That's also in the world of the five senses. Uh, there's no death, really, uh, in the mental world. Yeah, because the mental world kind of carries on. Uh, that is what you are left with uh, when you die. The mental world goes on and you move on to your next life. Uh, so all these problems that we experience in life, the problems of uh, all the things, the, all the issues that we have, the problems in the body, problems with the people around us, and problems in society, political instability, all the, you know, all the depression you get by watching the news or reading the news, uh, that disappears and it's no longer relevant when you go inwards. Uh, and this is why, as I mentioned, I think, in the beginning, yeah, that um, uh, this is the refuge from that world. Uh, yeah, this is where we go to find refuge from the world. Uh, the Buddha talk says that we should be Atta Deepa and Dhamma Deepa. Uh, we should be islands unto ourselves, or take the Dhamma as our refuge, take, you know, take ourselves as a refuge. Uh, this is what it means, uh, going inwards, leaving that world behind. Uh, so at this point, if you just kind of very, if you can't really think much at this point. If you think, you kind of destroy the whole thing. Yeah? But uh, sometimes going a little bit backwards, uh, and it's just reminding yourself very briefly that actually the whole world is uninteresting. Yeah? There's nothing in that world that really interests you. Yeah? You can let go of the five senses, let go of the body. There's so much trouble in that world. This inner world uh, is far more beautiful, uh, far more interesting, yeah? 
far more powerful, far more blissful, far more productive of insight, uh, far more productive of finding the meaning of life. This is where it is. Uh, the other stuff uh, is actually quite irrelevant. Uh. And then just that image, just that perception uh, of that world being uninteresting, yeah, it kind of being yucky in a sense. Uh. Yuck! It's just that thought of yuck. <laughs> uh, and then kind of leave it to one side. Uh, and then you come to the five sense, the uh, mental world instead. Uh, and then it becomes uh, stabilized, maybe, because you are letting go of that thing which is lower, which has less happiness, and which is far more problematic. Yeah. Then you can make that leap, uh, and you can kind of go, move on to the image uh, in the mind. Uh. And uh, it, it is at this point that sometimes people feel a little bit uh, fearful in the meditation. Uh, yeah. Many people have, have experienced sometimes a sense of fear because it seems to be so incredibly powerful. Uh. You go into this extraordinarily powerful state, uh, and it feels a bit like you are losing yourself. Uh. And that's what I was saying about dying just a minute ago. Uh. If you're losing yourself, it's a bit like uh, dying in a certain way. Uh. You're giving up something that is very close to you, very core to your identity, to who you th take yourself to be. Uh. And to give that up is always hard. Uh. And the thing that you are giving up, when you move into something that is so powerful, uh, you're giving up your ability to be in charge. It's like you're allowing nature to take over. Uh, and you just, you're just becoming one with this kind of larger thing. Uh. You're not fully one yet. It goes much further than this. Uh, but it's like the beginning of giving up your own identity to a larger reality. Uh. That's what it feels like. Uh. You're allowing something else to take over. Uh. And because of that, uh, when you hear about people of other religions who also meditate, you have this in Christianity, for example, uh, and you have this in many, many spiritual traditions, yeah, obviously in, uh, uh, in the Advaita Vedanta tradition, in part of uh, Hinduism uh, and other places, uh, this is where people say, this is God. Uh, yeah, because if you are giving up your sense of individuality to a larger kind of reality, uh, that is a bit like God, right? A merger with God or something like that. Uh, you can see why they would say that. Uh. But from a Buddhist point of view, it is just an experience. Yeah, it is an experience of giving up your identity. But to say it is God, that is adding something to the actual experience. There's, there's no label saying this is God or anything like that. It's just an experience. Uh, and so we want to avoid adding things unnecessarily. Because the moment you add something, well, then you are no longer really being open objective about what's going on. We want to have insight. We want to see things according to reality. We don't want to add uh, uh, interpretations for which there is no basis uh, of uh, adding. Uh. And this is kind of interesting if you ask, uh, you know, sometimes you can ask someone who is a Christian, well, why do you believe in God? And they will say, oh, because I have experienced God. And then you start to ask, well, what did you actually experience? Uh, and then they will give you an explanation, and it will be maybe something like this, right? And, you, and then you will see that actually they, what they experienced was real, but the label God is added to an experience. There's no way that you can actually experience God. You can have an experience that may, you may think is like the God, if you have a predetermined idea of what God is, but the actual God itself is actually unexperienceable. What is experienceable is this sort of thing here. So this is where things become incredibly interesting, experiencing the mind, like a samadhi nimitta. But you're not finished yet. Uh, yeah, the nimitta arises, uh, you see something like a disk, like the moon or the sun or whatever. Uh, but you want to go further. Uh, yeah, you can see how interesting this samadhi thing is. It's really exciting. It's like this uh, journey of exploration. Uh, into the unknown, uh, but a very interesting unknown. Uh. I was just saying the other day, one of the beautiful similes that you find in the suttas uh, is the similes of the ancient city. Uh. And the Buddha talks about the Dhamma and, and discovering the Dhamma. It's like going on this path in the jungle. Uh. And when you follow this ancient path in the jungle that was trodden by other Buddhas in the past, uh, you follow it along, you come to this ancient city. Uh. Yeah, it's like a journey of discovery. Imagine going through the jungle and finding these ruins from the past, uh, thousands of years ago. Huh? And the Buddha said, that's like finding Nibbana. Huh? 
And then when you find Nibbana, you teach it to the rest of the world. You build up this ancient city in the jungle again, uh, creating something for all people who are interested in the spiritual practice. Uh, so he, the Buddha is actually likening the uh, discoveries that we're doing with this kind of extra exploration, inner exploration, uh, in inner space, uh, uh, finding these uh, extraordinary things. Uh, and uh, it's, it is really, it is the most exciting, the most interesting discovery that anyone can do, is this sort of inner journey of discovery. Yeah. So then what we want to do is we want to use this uh, samadhi nimitta, this light in the mind, and we want to take the meditation further. Yeah. So what is the next thing? Yeah? The next thing after experiencing the mind is they practice like this. Uh, I will breathe in, gladdening the mind. We practice like this. I'll breathe out, gladdening the mind. Abhipamodayang chittang. Yeah? Abhipamodayang is like gladness. Yeah? So in other words, again, we are increasing the happiness yeah? more. As I was saying before, everything is about new levels of happiness, uh, taking it one stage further. Uh, and here we are empowering this samadhi nimitta, this light in the mind, uh, making it even more blissful. Uh. How do we do that? Uh, again, just by being still, uh, just by allowing the process to happen, uh, by unifying the mind. Uh, yeah, when you stay with the samadhi nimitta, you try to make it as simple as you possibly can, uh, focusing on the center of this, uh, not looking at the kind of edges or the diversity, but the simpler it is, uh, the more powerful it is going to be. Uh. And just allow it to still even further. Yeah? And the bliss arises as a consequence. Yeah? Yeah, it becomes even more blissful. Yeah? As if it wasn't blissful enough already. Yeah? And you can see why this is uh, sometimes a bit concerning. Yeah? How do you overcome the fear in this case that comes with these kind of things? Yeah? Well, the way you overcome it is just by experiencing it many, many times. Yeah? Doing it again and again. And as you familiarize yourself with these experiences, yeah, they become second nature. Yeah? And after a while, you, this becomes the new reality and the world you used to belong to, that becomes completely uninteresting to you. Huh? Because this is far more interesting huh, than anything you had before. So what you used to fear huh, becomes the thing that you are attracted to. Huh? So you gladden it uh, yeah, just by staying with it. Uh, and then after gladdening it, uh, 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 you breathe in stilling the mind. Uh, the translation here is immersing the mind in samadhi, stilling the mind, yeah? making it, uh, uh, allowing the samadhi to happen. You breathe out, uh, stilling the mind, uh, making it even more peaceful again. Stilling is about making it more peaceful. Uh, peace and happiness, uh, these two qualities going together. Uh, and again, the way to do that is just by staying with it, uh, allowing the mind to kind of become yeah, just the staying with the simplicity of the object, uh, uh, withdrawing the will, if you like, uh, yeah, even less will, uh, just kind of being completely peaceful, uh, allowing things to be, not doing anything, uh, and then this thing happens uh, by itself, uh, as if by magic, uh, going deeper and deeper and deeper, uh, greater and greater stillness, uh, more and more bliss. Uh, and you wonder where this is going to go. Yeah, can you, I mean, we have, so far, we have seen the sequence. There's just one happiness after the other one. More deep, one more deep than the previous one. One stillness more profound than the previous stillness. And it's like, what? where is this going? Yeah, and it's kind of, you can see why this is so interesting and so exciting and sometimes so a bit scary as well because of the power of these things. And then as this process happens, you come to the very last one, which is I will breathe in. Freeing the mind, I will breathe out. I practice breathing out, freeing the mind, uh, which is the very last one of all of these. Uh, I'll explain that in a second. But um, one of the things to notice here again uh, is that it is all about positive qualities of mind. Uh, yeah? And if you compare that to the Chitta Nupassana in the Satipatthana Sutta, the contemplation of mind, uh, there it is about all kinds of mental phenomena. They talk about the mind with greed, the mind without greed, the mind with ill will, the mind without ill will, the mind with delusion, the mind without delusion, the mind, the great mind, the unsurpassed mind, the liberated mind. 
And uh, so there we talk about mental qualities that are both good and bad, uh, yeah, and, and knowing all of these things. Uh, but here again, it's all about the good qualities. Uh. It's a similar to what we saw with feelings. Yeah, the bad feelings, the painful feelings are excluded here in the Anapanasati Sutta, whereas they are found in the Satipatthana Sutta. And it's the same idea. Yeah, you know these bad qualities not by their presence. Uh, you don't actually have to be aware of uh, desire and ill will to know what it is. Uh, you know them better by their absence. Uh, it is a cessation of things, uh, the absence of things, that actually allows you to understand these things fully. Because in their absence, well then, they become clear. Again, like the simile of the tadpole in the water becoming a frog. Yeah? You emerge from those qualities uh, and then you know what they are. Uh, so uh, all positive things, yeah? no need to contemplate the, the bad stuff. Well, you contemplate it, but you contemplate it because when they are absent. Uh, and then uh, the very last part here is freeing the mind. Uh, yeah? What does that mean, uh, freeing the mind? Uh, and again, you don't really do any freeing, uh, you allow the freeing to happen. Uh, yeah? So this is like when the nimitta reaches a certain stage, uh, and you kind of merge with that uh, sun, that disk, whatever. Uh, and because you merge with the sun and the disk, uh, and this can be experienced in different ways, uh, but when you merge with that, uh, your experience becomes completely unified. Uh. Up to this point, uh, there has been a sense of observer and the observed, uh, subject and object, uh, right? Because you are seeing a sun, so the sun is over there, you are here observing it. Uh. But when you merge with that uh, sign, uh, there is no distance anymore between the observer and the object. Uh, it's the only one experience, uh, subject and object becoming one. Uh, and this particular experience is called many things in the suttas, uh, but one of them is ekatta. Ekatta means uh, oneness, uh, or is called ekodibhava, having become one. Uh, or ekagata, you know, the peak uh, chitasa ekagata, the one-pointedness of mind. Uh, yeah, and again, this is, can be, again, quite scary, or it can be scary, even though it shouldn't be, because it's just the most delightful experience that anyone will ever have. Yeah, it can be scary because the sense of losing control again. If you merge with something else completely, you have no sense of individuality anymore, because you have kind of merged with the universe. There's no difference between you and everything else. That kind of, you're, it's like you're dying as an individual. And of course, that can be a bit worrying, right? Uh, <laughs> to put to say the least. Uh, um, but actually, the whole point is that this is a supremely blissful experience when you do that. Uh, and when you merge with the kind of the rest of the universe, again, you can see why people would call this unity with God. Uh, yeah, it has all of those qualities that a God normally is said to have. Uh, it is incredibly blissful. Uh, your sense of individuality is gone. You have merged kind of with the universe. Uh, you have no self-agency anymore because your sense of agency has disappeared. Uh, you're kind of stuck in this blissful realm. Uh, and it's the happiest thing you've ever experienced. Uh, these are the sort of things that people normally call God. Uh, but uh, as Buddhists would say, it is an experience. It is not adding the label God doesn't really help you very much uh, because you're adding things there which are not found there. Uh. So what are you freed from? Uh? When we talk about freedom, it is freedom from something. Uh, yeah? And the things that we are freed from here, uh, well, the first thing is the five senses. Uh. Yeah? The five senses are completely disappeared. Now there is no access to the five senses anymore. In the previous stages, the five senses are already fading into the background, uh, but only now are they so completely gone uh, that there's not even access uh, to those five senses. Uh, they're completely gone, and this is kind of really weird, right? Because we're always used to having the five senses around us. Uh, at least we have access to them. If you want to see, you can just open your eyes. Uh, but now the access is gone. Uh, and this is why, again, it can be difficult to enter these states, because essentially you are allowing yourself to go blind. You're allowing yourself to go deaf. Yeah, when there's no access to these things, it is as if you have gone blind. It is as if you have gone deaf. And the only way you can do that is by having no attachment to those five senses. If you're attached to them, there's no way you can enter these states. And so this is why it is so useful to 
uh, understand again the downside of that sensory world uh, and why this is an important part of Buddhist contemplation. Uh, because once you understand that, uh, then and only then uh, are you able to enter these kind of uh, these these sort of states. Uh, so what we're talking about here is the jhana experiences, right? The jhanas, uh, where the five sense world is completely gone. Uh. So that is, you're freed from the five senses. Uh. You're freed from the five hindrances. Uh. Yeah, this is the first time where the five hindrances are completely gone. Uh. The mind is completely bright. Uh. There is no restlessness anymore. The mind is completely focused on the object and uh, no movement in the mind. Uh. Uh, and uh, there's obviously no doubt because you're staying with the object, you're not kind of wavering anymore, you have entered the samadhi fully. Uh, the five hindrances are fully gone for the first time. Uh, that is also a freedom of a sort. Uh, it is called uh, vivi, uh, uh, vivicha akusalehi dhamehi, yeah? separated from unwholesome qualities. Uh, uh, viviceva kamehi, which means separated from the five senses, and then viviceva akusalehi dhamehi, this is the standard descriptions of the first jhana in the suttas, uh, separated from the five hindrances. Uh. But you're also separated from one more thing, uh, which kind of goes with the territory here, and this is you are given up the will. Yeah, you can't will anymore. Uh. You have no ability to um, do what you want. Uh, yeah, you are stuck in that state. Uh. And you just have to wait for the state to come to an end. And this is also a reason why this state is so hard to enter, because the will is such a dear part of our personality. Yeah, who, if I ask you who yourself, who people, who you take yourself to be, a lot of people would say the willing is a very important part of who you are. Yeah, we are the agents of our life. We are the creators of things. We are artists. We create things in the world. And when you give up your will, you're giving up the ability to do all of those things. Yeah, we identify with doing. Yeah. We identify with the projects that we do. We identify with uh, our translations. Uh, well, that's not we as me, sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, and um, so we identify with the doer. And there are certain people in the world who are compulsive doers. You can see that they do, 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 do. And they really enjoy doing. They feel alive when they do. Because they are expressing their sense of self through the act of doing. it. And the idea of giving up doing is like saying, I'm going to die, basically. Because that's what I am. I am the doer. So the doer is a core aspect of our sense of identity. So we are giving up here a very large sense of our identity here and who we take ourselves to be. And this is why also these are difficult states to enter. Well, not difficult, but they take a lot of uh, giving up again to be able to do that. Uh, so um, this goes very, this is very profound, uh, right? And this is why it is so uh, extraordinarily interesting, uh, precisely because it is so profound. Uh, and you can see here, it's becoming very obvious now, right, why there is so much insight that goes with these kinds of samad in this kind of samatha. You're giving up so much of the world. You see that this part of the world is not essentially who you are. You're getting insight into the idea of non-self. You're getting insight into things being impermanent because they are disappeared. And you're getting insight into happiness and suffering because you can see the bliss becoming more and more powerful as you go along. So this is the idea of uh, citta nupassana, taking it to this very limit. The very last thing we do is freeing the mind. And once you free that mind, uh, you enter the realms of the jhanas. Uh, and that is really where you come into the very last factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. You have the samma samadhi, uh, the right stillness of the mind. So here we're entering samma samadhi. Uh, the last thing that you do in Satipatthana, in mindfulness of breathing, is allowing the mind to enter these states. So the jhanas too are kind of, um, by implication, they are included in this process of mindfulness of breathing. So uh, this is where all of this is heading. Yeah? Yeah? And uh, to the deep, profound, uh, blisses of the mind, uh, etc. So that we are seeing here. This is the contemplation of the mind for you, uh, and uh, taken all the way here. Uh. So, 
Now we can come to the very last of the four Satipatthanas and we will see how this is expressed in the Anapana Sati Sutta. And um, uh, the last one of the four Satipatthanas is called Dhamma Nupassana. Yeah, Dhamma Nupassana. And uh, so this is the contemplation of the Dhammas. Uh, and it's interesting, what does that exactly mean, the Dhammas in this particular context? The word Dhamma is very broadly used in the suttas, uh, and it can be quite hard to pin it down. Uh, yeah, one meaning of the word Dhamma is like the uh, mental objects, the objects of mind, uh, which does not fit so well here because we've already seen many objects of the mind. Uh, another idea of Dhamma is the idea of nature or even causality uh, and these kind of things. Uh, and um, we will see that that actually fits maybe a little bit better here. Uh, and one of the translations that I like of Dhamma in this context is the idea of principles. Uh, and this is the, the uh, translation used by Venerable Sujato, who is a translator here. So contemplation of principles, and specifically the principles of causality, yeah? because causality and conditioning is such an incredibly important idea in Buddhism. Uh, Everything is causal, everything is conditioned, uh, nothing stands alone, uh, everything comes about because of other qualities. Uh, this is the whole idea of non-self. Yeah? If there is a self, if there is a God, uh, then there is something that stands apart from cause and conditions. Uh, but when there is no, if there is no self and there is no God, uh, then everything is part of this matrix of cause and conditions, uh, yeah? this uh, uh, intricate uh, uh, network of uh, things uh, supporting each other, building each other up, uh, causing each other to exist. Uh, so uh, this is what this last one is, uh, is about then, uh, is the idea of understanding this causality, these principles. Uh, it's equivalent to Dhamma Nupassana in the Satipatthana Sutta. So let's have a look at what it says. Uh, they practice like this. Uh, I will breathe in observing impermanence. They practice like this. I will breathe out observing impermanence. They practice like this. I will breathe in observing fading away. They practice like this. I will breathe out observing fading away. They practice like this. I'll breathe in observing cessation. They practice like this. I will breathe out observing cessation. They practice like this. I will breathe in observing letting go. They practice like this, I will breathe out, observing, letting go. So what we have here is four different degrees of insight, in a sense. Yeah? Four different degrees of uh, uh, seeing the impermanence in the phenomena, uh, in whatever phenomena, starting with basic impermanence, the Pali word for that is anicca, impermanence, uh, and the idea of impermanence has many different degrees to it, uh, but the basic idea is just change. Yeah? Things are changing. Yeah? Things are not steady. Yeah? So this is the starting point of contemplating impermanence. Yeah? The second point is the idea of fading away. Yeah? And the idea of fading away is that impermanence has a certain direction to it. Yeah? It is not just that things are impermanent, but that they are impermanent in a particular way. They fade away, yeah? gradually, gradually diminishing. Yeah? It's a kind, it's this particular kind of impermanence, an impermanence that is heading in a certain direction. Yeah? And when that fading away goes all the way to the end, yeah, to the very its culmination, yeah? then things cease, right? Cessation is the culmination of fading away. Yeah? That is therefore the third aspect here that we're looking at here. Yeah? First of all, you notice the changeability. Then you notice that the changeability has a certain direction. Things are fading, 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 ending up ultimately in cessation. Things ending completely. And then the last part, letting go, this is the result of seeing things ceasing. When you see things ceasing, even if you don't see it the first time, ultimately you let go. You don't desire those things anymore because things that can cease things that can disappear, things that turn out to be dukkha, problematic, they're no longer interesting. And because they're no longer interesting, you let go. Yeah? This is the idea of the ending of craving and desire for these things. 
So these are four levels of uh, insight, if you like, yeah? or four levels of seeing clearly. Yeah? Sometimes it is just immediately obvious that this is happening in your meditation. Yeah? Sometimes it, it, you, know, you don't have to go very deep. You can already see these things happening to some extent. Yeah? But the deeper you go, the more powerful these insight are, insights are going to be. <laughs> so uh, what are the things that we contemplate in this way? Yeah? What are the things we see as impermanent and fading away? Yeah? And uh, the answer is uh, the process of meditation that we have just been through, right? Uh, we look back upon that process of meditation, uh, and when you look back on that process, uh, this is exactly what you see. Uh, you see the things in your very experience. Uh, this has to do with our own experience, and not with some kind of uh, world out there or anything like that. This is your personal experience. Uh, you see these very qualities, uh, this very uh, sequence of things changing. You see that within your experience uh, through this process of meditation. Uh, yeah, and I'll explain to you in detail what exactly how this works. Uh, and uh, what is that experience that you have? Well, it is the experience of the breath becoming more and more subtle. You experience the joy, the mind, all of those kind of things. Uh, but what is that? Uh, well, what that is in the suttas is the five khandas, yeah, the five factors of personality or the five aggregates. That is what that is. Because the five aggregates, they are your experience. Right now, you're experiencing the five aggregates, right? Five aggregates, you can see things, the form, you have the body, the form, you have a certain feeling about what's going on, you perceive things, you have people, a room or whatever, you have a a sankara, you have a will, yeah, maybe you're directing your mind to what is being said and this kind of thing. Is it consciousness, the ability to be aware of what is going on? The five khandas is always there. They're always there. They are your experience at any time. So this is nothing but the contemplation of the five khandas. And it's very useful to know that, because very often when you read the suttas, it will say that you contemplate the five khandas, you understand the impermanence, the suffering, and the non-self of the five khandas, or you see the arising and passing away of the five khandas. It doesn't really explain how you do that. Well, this is how you do it. This is the process through which you come to gain insight into these five khandas, this very process that we're looking at now. So, how does it actually happen then? And uh, the way it happens is very, just like I was saying before, right? Uh, you see that as you go through this process, uh, the body is, first of all, it is impermanent. Yeah? The body kind of coming and going, you experience various parts of it, it's kind of always changing, there's nothing really solid about it. Uh, this could also be the uh, element contemplation, for example, can be about the impermanence of the body. Uh, but throughout this process, uh, you will see the body fading away, right? That's kind of the point of this process. The body gradually diminishing, you feel less and less of it, and you're very happy when the body kind of is disappearing, because you realize the body is a nuisance, uh, yeah? Kind of fading and fading, until eventually, uh, when you enter the, when you get the nimittas, especially when you come to the jhana states, uh, you read the body is completely gone, it has ceased. And when the body has completely ceased, then you know three things. Yeah? Contemplation in Buddhism is always about three things. We contemplate things in terms of what is called the three characteristics. Three characteristics of impermanence, suffering, and non-self. And because the body has completely gone, that is the highest kind of impermanence. There's no access to the body anymore. You have entered a purely mental world. Uh, this is what the jhana experiences are. Uh, and because the body is completely gone, there's no access to it, uh, you know it must be completely impermanent. Uh, yeah, it is gone. And when the body is gone, uh, you feel really blissed out. Uh, you realize the body was bad. Yeah, you, that doesn't mean you become angry with the body or you become kind of self hate or anything like that. It just means that actually the body was so much dukkha. And it's very hard for us to understand how much dukkha the body is, uh, because normally we delight in the body. Yeah? We haven't really got the perspective to understand what is going on. Uh, again, it's this idea of the simile and the frog and the tadpole and the water. Uh, you have to step out of the body to understand what it is. Uh, 
stepping out of the body. I like that idea. But anyway, you, <laughs> it's like some kind of uh, psychic experience. So the spirit kind of poof comes out, and then the body step out of it. Uh, of course, those experiences can be had. Uh, but here you are transcending the body in a certain way. Uh, and then you understand the dukkha of that body. Uh, yeah, it's fascinating if you watch yourself, uh, how often you will move, right? A little bit, uh, because the body is so problematic. There's always little things in the body. Uh, there's little aches here, little problems there. Uh, and then we have to move and then we have to scratch it. Uh, and uh, it's so, we're so used to being in that dukkha, in that problem, uh, that actually we're not really aware of how much dukkha it is until you leave the body aside. Uh, you emerge from it, uh, and then you understand what's going on. Uh. So you learn about impermanence fully, yeah? the ending of the body. The body is completely gone. Uh. You learn about suffering. You understand the body is a real problem. There's an alternative experience of the world that is far more interesting uh, than the body. Uh. And lastly, you learn about non-self. Uh. And the reason you learn about non-self is because there is no access to the body anymore. The body is left behind. You cannot choose to experience it because you have entered a different reality and you have to wait for that reality to wear out before you can experience the body again. And if there is something that you cannot access at will, then by definition that thing is non-self. A self is something that you can access whenever you want to. You can make it be like this, you can make it not be like that. Uh, that is how it is expressed in the famous uh, Anatolakana Sutta, the characteristics of non-self. In that sutta, it is found in the uh, uh, Sangyutta Nikaya Connected Discourses, the Kanda Sangyutta, which is the 22nd chapter, Sutta number 59. Uh, you find the Anatolakana Sutta, the characteristics of non-self. Uh, a very, very interesting discourse, uh, and it talks about what it means that something is a self or not a self. Uh, and it says that if you uh, uh, can uh, command something, be like this, don't be like that, uh, then it must be yourself. Uh, you are, in other words, you are in charge of it, uh, you are in control of it. Uh, so something that can completely disappear, that you cannot even access, by definition cannot be a self. Uh, so you see the non-self nature of the body. Uh, so this is why these experiences of samadhi are so uh, pregnant with insight. Uh, yeah? Because they, it actually comes with the territory. Uh, and when you emerge from those stages of samadhi afterwards, you cannot help by noticing these things. Yeah? And um, so what we are trying to do here is to kind of emphasize that insight a little bit. So when you come out of the samadhi, you actually notice, you actually remember, you actually uh, make it a deliberate effort to understand what is going on, uh, instead of just kind of allowing it to be. Uh, and you don't have to go through the whole process uh, to notice these things. Uh, yeah? Part of the fading away of the body, uh, you will notice, even if you go through only some of these steps, uh, you will start to see the body fading away, the impermanence of the body will become reasonably obvious. So you start to see this process in action, even if you don't go all the way, which is good because most people cannot, you know, it takes a while to go all the way with this process. And so you start to have little insights into the nature of these five khandhas. From the very, fairly early on, you don't have to go all the way to this process. So that is like the body, right? And then there is not just the body, but then you have the, uh, like the five senses that are very closely related to the body. Exactly the same thing happens with the five senses. Uh, they gradually fade away. Yeah, okay, uh, um, smelling and tasting is gone pretty quickly because they're not really being used very much. Uh, the eyesight also is gone, uh, largely. Uh, and then when the body fades away, it means that the sense of touch uh, is largely gone. Uh, and then this, the uh, uh, sense of sight, of hearing rather, uh, is like the last one, which often kind of is still there. Yeah? The breath can also be there, so a little bit of the body. Uh, and then these also fade away towards the very end. Uh, so the five senses are gone. Uh, and when the five senses are gone, again you feel free. Uh, and you realize that the five senses were a prison. Uh, that's kind of extraordinary, because we tend to enjoy the five sense world so much. Uh, yeah, the five sense world, that's where we go to uh, have our entertainment, we go to art galleries, we go into nature and see all the beautiful nature which is around here. Uh, and that's okay, nothing wrong with that. In fact, it can be a very good thing to do. Uh, 
But just realize when you enter these states that actually it was a prison. It was something that actually was an irritation in the mind because the five sense world is very diverse. It is very movable, this change all the time. And this kind of makes the mind tired, right? You have to deal with all this change and things all the time. So when you give up the five sense world and the mind unifies, that's why the energy becomes so incredibly powerful. Because all of those things that dissipate your energy suddenly it kind of comes together in the mind and you become like this nuclear reactor. This is one of Ajahn Brahm's expressions for deep samadhi. You become like a nuclear reactor. So if you haven't experienced the nuclear reactor yet, you haven't still, still haven't been to the real samadhi experience. I don't actually know what the nuclear reactor feels like, but uh, it sounds pretty awesome. Uh, so um, we'll just take Adam Ram's word for that, uh, that uh, this is a nuclear reactor territory. Uh, fading away, disappearing, yeah? And you see then the dukkha of the five senses because of the pain that day uh, uh, is gone and now you feel happy. Uh, you no longer have any access to the five senses, uh, so there must be non-self. Uh, you cannot see even if you want to, because you can't even want seeing them, because the, the sense of uh, wanting is gone, right? Uh, so you see the three characteristics uh, as they apply to the five senses. Uh, then there is the will. This is the Sankara Kanda, yeah? the, the four of the five Kandas. Uh, and the will, of course, through this whole process becomes calmer and calmer and calmer. Uh, there's less and less things going on uh, within you. Uh, that means that there's less and less doing. Uh, the will, uh, the sense of agency, is gradually fading away. Fading away, fading away, fading away, until you enter the jhana and it is ceased completely. Uh, there's no more doing going on. Uh, you cannot even do because you are kind of frozen in that state of jhana for a certain time. Uh, so the will is fading away here. Uh, and again, this is also one of those things that is a uh, very liberating here. Yeah? yeah, and it's kind of an extraordinary thing to realize this because we, in, again, we tend to worship the will because the will is what gives us kind of the ability to do many things in the world, the agency. We think of artists as kind of some of the supreme creators in the world. So we kind of worship works of art, even though they are terrible works of art. Uh, have you seen some of these works of art people create? And they kind of, they get praised and, and to the skies, and I just find them actually depressing. Yeah. What is that very famous British artist, Francis Bacon? Have you seen some of his paintings? It's like, oh. <laughs> and, I, and it's kind of weird. How, and the, I think the reason why we, it's, it's really creative, I have to admit. It's kind of pretty awesome creative, even though it's also very disturbing at the same time. And we have we put creativity on the pedestal, yeah, this ability to create things. So. And then you realize in your meditation that actually all this creativity thing actually is a nuisance. So. It's a problem. Uh. Yeah, from the very high level it is a problem uh, because actually it is painful. Uh. And then when you emerge or you leave all that creativity behind, uh, yeah, you realize first of all it is suffering, uh, it is impermanent because it is gone. Uh. And it is non-self, because you can no longer do any activity in those states. You can no longer access the doing. It's completely left behind, and you feel better than you ever did before. And you realize why ever you were so keen on all this activity, all this creativity. It is, was a mistake. I made a mistake. Okay, tick, leave it behind. And that is when you enter these jhana states. So again, yeah, the whole idea here of... Uh, insight coming with the territory of samadhi. Uh, yeah, this is what you see here. And you can see here how all the five khandas yeah, are, uh, are really part of this. Yeah? We have seen the body, that's obviously the rupa khanda, the first khanda, the first person. Right? We have seen the feelings, how the feelings gradually, the painful feelings disappear, certain happy feelings disappear until you enter the jhana state. So you have the, this kind of experience with feelings, yeah, they uh, gradually cease, they gradually come to an end, then you can't access them anymore. Uh, perceptions, all of these things are kinds of perceptions. The perception become more and more refined. You're giving up perceptions of the body and the five senses. You're giving up certain mental perceptions. Uh, and you enter the jhana, all you're left with is the perception of bliss. Uh, even the perception of duality, yeah? The jhanas are a non-dual experience. 
They are the Advaita experience, non-duality. And so all the other perceptions are gone. Yeah, so all of those things, the perceptions, you see those in terms of the three characteristics. And then you have the, the will, and then you have consciousness itself. Yeah, you see the various kinds of consciousness, the consciousness of the five senses disappearing, ceasing, coming to an end. And all you have left at the end is the mind consciousness. Everything else has gone. And then during the jhana experiences, as you go even deeper, even aspects of mind consciousness starts to disappear. And eventually the penny drops. And actually everything is impermanent. Everything is non-self. Everything is suffering. And that's why you make a breakthrough to stream entry eventually, seeing kind of uh, the nature of all the five khandas in this way. Yeah. And then that is where the last factor comes in. Yeah, Pati nisagga in Pali, letting go. Yeah. You let go of everything yeah, because it's all hot coals. Yeah. Do you want to hold on to hot coals or do you want to let go of the hot coals? Yeah. Hot coals are painful. Yeah. Yeah, don't hold on to them. Actually, you don't have to think that. It's automatic, the experience. So this is the experience of mindfulness, of breathing. And it's kind of extraordinary, isn't it? It's kind of a remarkable thing. Now, what I have said here may, I think, it should make a little bit of sense, hopefully. It, at least, it makes more sense than maybe just a bare explanation of understanding the impermanence of the five khandhas. Uh, this gives you a little bit of meat on the bones. Uh, yeah, it kind of gives an idea of how to actually do this, how it actually happens. Uh, this is kind of what this is, uh, how the whole process then unfolds. Uh, and um, maybe take this to its logical conclusion, yeah? how kind of the awakening experience and everything happens as a result of this. Uh, so when you have these kind of experiences and you see all the five khandhas as uh, suffering, yeah, as non-self, uh, yeah, and as impermanent in this way, yeah, when you see that, especially when you see that everything is suffering, yeah, it is again like this idea that you have been holding on to hot coals all the time. Why am I holding on to hot coals? It's stupid. I'm, I've, I've been, been fooled all this time. I thought that these coals, coals were cool when actually they're hot. It's like a hot plate. I like this idea of the hot plate. You come into your house, you have a hot plate in your house, someone has turned it on. You think it has been off. You put your hand on the hot plate by accident. What do you do when you put your hand on that hot plate? You think, oh yeah, it's hot. Should I remove my hand or should I not? If you think like that for two seconds, it's too late, right? You already burnt yourself. So you don't think the withdrawal happens by itself. And this is exactly what happens here with this uh, mental experience of dukkha, of the five khandhas. The mind withdraws by itself. Uh, you don't have to make it do that. Uh, all you have to do is get the insight uh, and the understanding. And then the nibbida, the aversion, the kind of withdrawing of the mind from that world happens. Uh, and that withdrawing of the world uh, then leads to viraga, which is the ending. The same thing here, as here is called patinisagga. The letting go of that world, the ending of craving, the ending of desire. Why? Because how on earth can you desire suffering here when happiness is on offer? We'll take the happiness. Thank you very much. And this is the idea. This is how then you come to the very end of the path. And this then is called liberation. Yeah? Vimutti and Vimutti Nanadasana on the end. When you are liberated from Dukkha, you're liberated from yourself. Falkanda is who you are, right? So you're liberated from yourself, which is kind of cool. Right? So you no longer have any attachment to these five khandas. Uh. That is how this uh, works. And uh, do you agree with this? Do you think it's a good idea? Yeah? Okay, some of you agree? Okay, <laughs> good. It's pretty cool, isn't it? I mean, once you start to understand what is going on, uh, it kind of makes sense, right? Uh, it doesn't seem so alien anymore. Uh, and as you start, as you do your meditation, as you have some success with this, uh, as you start to let go, as you become a little bit peaceful, uh, you start to actually see this in action. Uh, you don't see it fully, uh, but you start to see how you let go a little bit so you understand a little bit about impermanence. Uh, things fade away even more so you start to understand a bit about the fading away. Uh, and you start to apply this idea of suffering, impermanence and non-self even to those small little things as you do it. 
Yeah, okay, now I understand why the body is suffering. I'm feeling really blissed out now. Why is that? Well, part of it because the body is gone now. And you start to kind of, these things start to come around and you start to feel what this is. It's no longer alien now. Because sometimes the suttas can seem alien. They're starting to become real in your own experience. The um, idea of non-self can seem very scary here. But actually it is not scary at all. It is very simple. If you feel more peaceful in your meditation, the reason why you feel peaceful, the reason part of it is giving up the thinking mind, yeah? giving up the thinking mind is very pleasant. And giving up the thinking mind is also a kind of non-self experience because the thinking is really the reinforcement of the self all the time. The self is what thinks or the sense of self is what thinks. So you start to realize that actually non-self is actually not scary at all. It's actually very blissful. The more you give up of the sense of self, the more happy you feel. And so by making these things real, yeah, by making them kind of part of our experience, that is really how uh, you can make sense of these concepts and not feel scared of them or concerned about them, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, all right, so let us uh, finish off this uh, sutta. Um, actually, it's a very long sutta, but I'll just finish off the little bit that is left here. Uh, and then the Buddha says, uh, Mindfulness of breathing, when developed and cultivated in this way, is very fruitful and beneficial. And now you kind of get the idea why that is the case. And then just to summarize at the very end, it actually it carries on for a long time after this. It talks about how each of the each of these um, groups yeah, fulfills the Satipatthana, then how that fulfills the seven factors of awakening, eventually fulfilling uh, knowledge and freedom. But uh, here, just the very beginning of that. Uh, whenever a mendicant knows that they breathe heavily or lightly, uh, or experiencing the whole body or stilling the physical processes, uh, at that time they are meditating by observing an aspect of the body. Uh, keen, aware, and mindful. Uh, rid of covetousness and bitterness for the world. What? Covetousness for the world? All right. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> For I say that the in breath and the out breath are an aspect of the body. That is why at that time a mendicant is meditating by observing an aspect of the body, keen, aware, mindful, rid of covetousness and bitterness for the world. So um, this shows you how the first of these tetrads fulfills the Satipatthana. It shows you that the breath is called a body, and why this then is body contemplation. And uh, it also has this nice little uh, phrase here about the meaning of satipatthana, yeah? what it actually is, uh, this idea of covetousness and things for the world. Uh, um, but I don't think I will talk about that now, because uh, we have, I've been talking way too much already. Uh, so we'll come back to that uh, tomorrow, maybe in the next sutta, uh, and I think we will just... Uh, uh, end with that particular uh, that particular point. I think that is really quite enough. So um, uh, just to kind of maybe uh, summarize a little bit, uh, this is what uh, mindfulness of breathing can do for you if you take it all the way. Uh, and uh, it just shows you the kind of extraordinary things that is possible through the kind of very humble idea of just breathing and being aware. Uh, there's only two things that you need, the breath and awareness. Yeah, we have those things already to some degree. Obviously, we have the breath. Awareness is a bit more, a bit more uncertain, but uh, we can develop it in the right way. And that is really all you require. Yeah, take you all the way to this, on this extraordinary and very, very interesting path. So, good luck. <laughs> yeah, and the... All you really need to do is just continue enjoying yourself on this retreat, yeah? Don't try too hard. Uh, just keep on enjoying yourself in a gentle way. Uh, and as you do that, hopefully you'll be able to experience that is the beginning parts uh, of this uh, process of meditation, right? And that will give you already a lot of encouragement. Uh, it is very profound. Don't ever despair because you're not able to go all the way. Uh, 
Remember that the people in the world who actually gain the jhana states are quite rare. Yeah, it's not common at all to experience these things. Uh, to experience a little bit of bliss and happiness in meditation, that is much more common. But again, the majority of people probably never experience any bliss even in the meditation. Uh, so don't feel that uh, these things should be experienced or that you should have them. There is no shoulds on this path. Uh, there is only doing what you require to do with your body and mind uh, to gradually move you in the right direction. What matters is not what you experience, uh, but whether you are heading in the right direction. Uh, if you are heading in the right direction, guaranteed you will experience it sooner or later. Uh. So that is uh, all for now. Uh, so please have a nice cup of tea or whatever, and we'll see you back again for some more meditation at 7 o'clock. Okay.